light term. If I use this word, I don't really get to the real power of the midbrain. There are other words that describe this better. There's a, a four-letter word. It starts with an F. It ends with a K. Um, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> uh, I used to in this lecture, and, and then I moved to the state of Utah. <laughs> and I realized real quick, <laughs> no faster way to clear a room in the state of Utah than to start using language like that. So I'm, I'm trying to improve myself by not using language like that. But in your mind, that's the word you should put there. <laughs> because that's, that's what the midbrain handles. <laughs> and so know this, the midbrain is a powerful part of the brain. <laughs> been around for a long time, <laughs> not entirely comfortable with the midbrain. It's not a good neighborhood, the midbrain. <laughs> but it is critically important for moment-to-moment -moment survival. <laughs> and so that's, that's, about as, that's about as good as I can do to give you a sense of this part of the brain. And it turns out, it turns out <laughs> that drugs don't work up here. They work here. And the defect of addiction is not here. Here, something goes wrong at a level of brain processing long before morals or personality or what mom did or any of that other stuff. Now, how do we know this? How can I say this with such certainty that drugs work here, not so much here? Well, we know this because of these very famous experiments were that which were done back in the 50s on mice, right? These are called the famous Olds experiments. And what Dr. Olds was trying to do was figure out where in the brain do drugs work. And he had figured out a way to test individual spots in the brain. If you just inject a mouse with an addictive drug, then it goes all over in the brain. You don't find out where it's working exactly. But he could put a probe in a very discrete part of the brain, and then through that probe, release an addictive drug, usually cocaine, and then see what the mouse did. If he pressed a lever to deliver more drug there, then you know that that part of the brain was the part that in was involved in drug high and maybe an addiction. And since everybody knew that was going to be in the frontal areas, that was the first place that they were going to look. Now, the drug that they used in this experiment, um, the drug neuroscientists always use to create addiction quickly in laboratory animals is cocaine. And very often when I give this lecture to patients, this fact upsets them because they're not all cocaine addicts. And the alcoholics, they get all bent out of shape, and they say, you know, why, why has it always got to be cocaine? Why can't it ever be my drug? Why can't it be alcohol? <laughs> a a and I have to tell them, uh, listen, alcohol is a fine drug, okay? <laughs> Nothing wrong with alcohol. No one's trying to diss alcohol here, okay? The problem is, if you use alcohol in this experiment, it confounds it. You dose the mouse with alcohol, you give him a lever to press. After a few presses, he uh, passes out. There's not much behavior to observe in a passed out mouse. He's kind of passed out. <laughs> then, then the opioid addicts will speak up and they'll say, well, then why can't it be my drug? Why can't it be heroin? Why can't it be oxycodone? And I say, okay, well, if you're a heroin addict, you know, be proud, right? Don't start <laughs> taking crap. Um, the problem is the same, though. You dose the mouse with heroin. You give him a lever to press. After about two or three presses, the mouse nods off. I mean, there's, there's nothing to see. Then the methamphetamine addicts chime in, and they say, well, then why can't it be my drug? Why can't it be methamphetamine? Now, the problem with methamphetamine is that it's too long-acting. So if you dose the mouse with methamphetamine, he's gone for the next six hours. He's running around. <laughs> he's cleaning up his cage. He's picking at his tail. He's getting stuff done, right? So you don't know. <laughs> is he pressing the lever for methamphetamine because he likes methamphetamine, because he finds it pleasurable? Or is he just pressing everything in sight, right? <laughs> You can't use gambling because mice don't really have a concept of when to double down. <laughs> you can't use sex because, well, <laughs> you need another willing mouse, and apparently mice don't like to have sex with other mice if they've got probes sticking out of their heads, so that <laughs> doesn't why they're either. So I'm not saying that these other things aren't addictions. They are. They're in the club. It's just that in the lab, cocaine works best because it's a very intense pleasure, and it's very short-acting. And so the pleasure is on, immediately off, and then you can see what will the mouse do next to get it back. And so they started putting drugs in the cortex of the mouse, in the higher areas of the brain, and nothing happened. In other words, the mouse did nothing. There was cocaine in that mouse's brain, but he didn't press the lever. It was only when they got around to testing these two tiny little spots deep in the midbrain that they saw an effect, right? And at this level of brain processing, the mouse and the human are exactly the same. If you drop a probe, and this is why these experiments are so famous, 
into one of these spots and dose that mouse with cocaine, behavior change is immense. He reaches out his little paw and he starts pressing that lever like there's no tomorrow. And he won't do anything else. He will no longer be. After a few hours of pressing the lever, that mouse is starving. He must be getting a very powerful eat message, survival message, from his midbrain. Does he listen to it? Does he take his paw off that lever for cocaine and grab a food pellet, save his life? No, he doesn't. He ignores the eat imperative and continues to press the lever for cocaine. Does he, uh, and he will not kill either. The other part of kill is he will not defend himself from harm. So you can put an electrified grate in front of a lever for cocaine and shock the mouse. Will he step off the grate? No, he won't. He'll sit there and fry and keep on pressing the lever for cocaine. You see what's happened is that somehow the drug went to that top spot on the list. It hijacked that survival hierarchy. Now it's in the number one spot. The solution to starvation isn't eating anymore. It's in the drug. The relief from being burned by an electrified grate is no longer in simply stepping off the grate. The relief is somehow locked up in the drug. And so the mouse will continue to use that drug to the exclusion of all the other survival behaviors until he's dead. And so this is what the old study showed us. Mice, and you can do this in any mouse, and it not just doesn't just work on mice, it works all the way up the food chain to monkeys. So whether you're talking about mice or monkeys, drugs of abuse, mice will self-administer drugs of abuse only to these two areas. They'll do so to the exclusion of all other survival behaviors until they're dead. What is the take home message from the old study? That mice can get addicted to drugs. Which admittedly doesn't sound all that fascinating until you realize that I can produce an addiction. I can produce a powerful and rapidly fatal addiction in an animal that has no personality, that does not care how his mommy mouse raised him. We do not have a problem with mouse gangs selling drugs to other mice back in Utah. I don't know about y'all. And yet you can still have addictions. And so this was the study that showed us that um, you <laughs> these things <laughs> these things might go along with addiction, okay, but they cannot be the cause of addiction. So I'm not saying that some uh, addicts don't have bad morals or are have bad personalities or grew up in a bad home. What I'm saying is you don't need that for addiction. And as a matter of fact, we have addicts who grew up in wonderful families and have terrific friends and score better than you and me on pro-social and empathic personality inventories and yet sometimes they become addicted. This is another interesting thing about Utah is that you know, the culture creates slight differences in the way the addiction manifests itself. We don't have as much binge drinking on the BYU campus. I mean, we just don't. But does that mean that people don't escape addiction? No, we have a terrible, terrible prescription opioid problem. In fact. Utah has led the nation in methadone deaths for, for several years now, I think. Um, and the typical case is the good kid. Doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, does everything his parents tell him, doesn't swear, is going on his mission, great grades, good football player, has a scholarship to the U or to BYU. Gets injured, loses his scholarship, laid up in bed, exposed to oxycodone, can't get the oxycodone anymore, switches over to heroin. And so this kid has none of those traditional Stigmatic, uh, uh, stigmatizing uh, features about him, and yet addiction is still possible. So it was these studies that showed that the picture that we had put together of the addict was in fact probably something that we were imposing upon them, projecting onto them. So again, what happened here is that the drug went to the top spot in the on the list. Now for this addicted midbrain, the drug and actual survival are so close together that as far as the midbrain is concerned, they're the same thing. Now the drug and actual survival are indistinguishable at this unconscious level of brain processing. And when that happened, when the drug became survival, that's when we crossed the line into freedom. Most people are over here. I'd say about nine out of 10 people can safely be called not addicts, okay? Never used, used a long time ago, occasionally used, maybe they even abuse. But for the non-addict, the drug is just the drug. The beer is just the beer. But when we cross the line into that temptation, the true addict, the drug is not the drug anymore. The drug is now life itself. And here's the tough part. It's very hard to tell who's who when you start getting close to this line. In other words, I don't have a definitive test, not yet, that can tell me the difference 
between the person right here on the left, the really 